Hi everyone, welcome to our day two coverage here at SNA 2024 in Washington DC. We start two days coverage with BA system and the adaptable deck launcher. Good morning, my name is Tate Westbrook. I'm a retired US Navy Commodore and currently working for BA Systems as a subject matter expert in surface naval guns and surface missile launchers. All right, Tate, so adaptable deck launcher. Uh, I believe uh, you received a contract award in the fall last year. Uh, can you tell us more? Correct, uh, BA Systems was awarded the contract from the US Navy for the next generation evolved Sea Sparrow launching system which we are answering with the adaptable deck launcher, a four cell version of this launcher to replace the older launchers on aircraft carriers and large deck amphibious ships. All right, so uh, the adaptable deck launcher, I believe is not entirely new. It was uh, first tested back in the 90s, but uh, in your opinion, why is it uh, relevant today and uh, the, the US Navy is, uh, is procuring it? Sure. This is one of the programs that BA Systems has developed to answer the Navy's three-part requirement for enhanced lethality of its ships, enhanced capacity of that lethal capability, and lower overall cost. The adaptable deck launcher is lower to maintain, no moving parts other than the hatch, and easily loaded and reloaded at sea. Uh, right next to you is uh, no, another interesting model uh, showing a DDG-51 uh, fitted with a number of uh, adaptable uh, deck launcher. So that's not a program of record, but that's something you're advocating the Navy to, to look at? That's correct. The adaptable deck launcher designed around the Mark 41 missile canister makes it scalable. Shown here is a two cell version. We also have a four cell version and an eight cell version available in both Evolved Sea Sparrow missile length as well as full strike length. So it's capable of launching any of the family of the Mark 41 missiles. We show it here on a U.S. Navy Arleigh Burke class destroyer as an alternative, or not alternative, but a way that the Navy can expand its capacity on board. When I was commanding officer of a U.S. Navy destroyer and later Commodore of our ships in Europe and Africa, I was always thinking for a high-end fight, I've only got 96 cells available. With the adaptable deck launcher as shown here, up to eight launchers on deck with Evolve Sea Sparrow would provide an additional 64 missiles for short and medium range ship defense. And this of course is very relevant today when we look at current events uh, in the Red Sea. That's correct. Uh, certainly the U.S. Navy and her allies have uh, been very active in recent events as recently as yesterday in the Red Sea and currently are spending some very expensive missiles, the Standard Missile 2 at nearly $2.1 million. So an alternative of having additional Evolved Sea Sparrows or the Mark 45 gun may be a better cost exchange solution for the U.S. Navy. And uh, if I may add, uh, European uh, frigates are notorious for having a uh, low number of uh, VLS per mm -hmm. hulls. Uh, is this something you're promoting to uh, your partners and allies? A absolutely. This is very scalable with its size, again available in two cell, four cell or even eight cell launchers. And it is deck mounted, meaning there is no deck additional deck structure below decks or deck penetrations required. So it's easily adaptable to any class of ship to be able to add additional capacity. But because it's based on the Mark 41 missile launcher uh, system and electronics, the ease with which it could be integrated into U.S. Navy warships or those of our allies and partners will be rapid deployed with minimal integration. Last but not least, uh, Tate, uh, I've been seeing uh, models of the adaptable deck launcher on uh, USBs and crewed surface vessels. Uh, is this the right way to weaponize those platforms? Um, absolutely. The, the advantage of the adaptable deck launcher provides a low maintenance, low center of gravity, and no moving parts option. And one of the biggest advantages of the adaptable deck launcher is it's rapidly reloadable at sea. Very well, Ted. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, and uh, please enjoy the rest of the show. Welcome to Surface Navy Association 24.
are now on the Lockheed Martin booth. Uh, standing behind this uh, very interesting model of uh, Freedom Type LCS fitted with three Mark 70 payload delivery systems. Uh, to find out more about this uh, concept, I am standing next to Tyler Griffin from uh, Lockheed Martin RMS. Tyler, good morning. Hey, good morning. Nice to meet you, Xavier. Likewise, and uh, thanks for your time uh, answering a few of my uh, questions. So that that's an interesting uh, model, uh, probably the most interesting on the show floor here at uh, SNA this year. Uh, can you tell us what you're trying to demonstrate with this model? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lockheed Martin is showcasing our 40 years of vertical launching system expertise and heritage and partnership with the United States Navy and finding additional ways to get more players on the field. And one way we do that is similar to the demonstration in October of 2023, where USS Savannah, uh, an LCS class ship, fired um, a containerized weapon downrange. And if you've got 400 square feet of deck space, we can bring a capability in in seven hours and remove it five hours later um, and bring those additional players to the fleet. Right. So that test was uh, with an independence type uh, LCS uh, based in, uh, in, in San Diego. Here it's on a Freedom type LCS. Uh, you can put several containers. How many missiles can uh, be fitted in each container? Yeah, as you can see in the model, there are four cells per launcher, and we would go through a safety and certification for a modular effector. And these containerized systems, as you noted, can go on different classes within the fleet uh, or different ships. And those systems demonstrating not only extended ranges, but extended capabilities um, for new platforms um, and existing platforms alike. So, the container feature uh, Mark 41 uh, VLS, so any missile compatible with the Mark 41 can be deployed from the, your container Mark 70 uh, system. Yeah, so specifically in October, the US Navy launched an SM6 downrange at a designated target, and a comparable system from the same containerized baseline, the US Army has launched both SM6 and Tomahawk effectors. Um, and that demonstrates the modularity of this containerized approach to getting more capability downrange. And uh, Tyler, uh, looking to the future, uh, are you looking at uh, what comes next after Mark 41? Yeah, that's a great question. And Lockheed Martin Xavier has been investing for more than a year on expanding beyond the Mark 41 vertical launching system heritage and expanding for more modular and more extended range effectors, staying ahead of ready. And we're doing that through something we call the Growth Vertical Launching System, or Growth VLS. Um, and that system is designed for modularity. And Arleigh Burke class ships being its baseline, it can also, similar to these containerized systems, be extended in a modular fashion uh, across the fleet to get more range and more lethality uh, to more players in theater. Uh, Tyler, uh, do you expect uh, VLS growth uh, to be able to accommodate uh, next generation weapon systems such as hypersonics? Yeah, designed with a hot launch capability in mind, we want to have a safe, certifiable way to bring more capability to the fleet. Um, modular hypersonics um, being in that discussion space with our customers and our partners. All right, Tyler, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Tom, great to see you again. Good to see you again, Xavier. So you unveiled a uh, Pack 3 integration with Mark 41 and uh, Aegis as a concept uh, one year ago at SNA 2023. Uh, today, SNA 2024, uh, what can you share with us regarding this uh, program? So, um, the progress has been steady all along. I think the, the big update was one of our key milestones was to test the S-band missile communications radio, which we did up in Morristown this last summer. We had a successful test communicating with the SPY-1 radar at CSED. So, the prototype radio was 
perform satisfactorily and so that it allows us to keep moving forward. Um, the next big update is our first um, flight test will be coming up here in the not too distant future. And Tom, can you uh, guide us through uh, briefly uh, again uh, what's the, what, what would be the benefit for the Navy to, to, to go ahead with this solution? Sure, so um, the PAC-3 MSE is the most capable surface-to-air missile in the world right now. It would take advantage of an active production line that the U.S. Army has of 500 missiles per year right now and ramping up to 550. Um, and so it, it addresses a number of both capability and capacity gaps that the Navy has right now. So that's, that, that's the, the primary reason why the Navy is quite interested in it, um, but it's all up to them and the DOD whether the funding is available to pursue it further. All right, Tom, thank you very much. Right, you betcha. Thanks, Xavier. Good to see you again. We are now with uh, Raytheon uh, to discuss uh, the latest with the SPY-6 uh, program. I am with uh, Mike Mills. Mike, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm great, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here at uh, SNA 2024. Uh, so, Mike, uh, news uh, came out uh, this afternoon that uh, the first of the backfitted uh, destroyer with uh, the SPY-6 V4 uh, is going to be uh, USS Pinckney. Can you uh, share a little more details with us about this? Yeah, we, uh, we've been working on the DDG Mod 2.0 program with the U.S. Navy for the last few years. As a matter of fact, they just, as you can see in the background, the V4 configuration, uh, we got under award for the first production of V4 back in March of last year. So it's off and running. The, the Navy is very focused on getting uh, this to the fleet as quickly as possible, this technology. And one of the main reasons is because you think about new class of ships, brand new ships to, that you have to build, they take a long time. This is the, the fastest way to get this technology to fleet is through the back, backfit program. So for now, you're under contract to upgrade how many, how many ships? Under this current five-year contract, they, they have four, four uh, uh, that they plan to award. And these are all, all uh, Flight 2 Alpha ships? All Flight 2 A's, yes. Starting with DDG-91, the Pygmy. Uh, and Mike? Uh, what kind of uh, new capability will uh, the SPY-6 V4 bring compared to the uh, legacy SPY-1 radars? So, as you remember with the V1 configuration, the AMDR, it, that is a ballistic missile defense uh, capability. It is basically uh, a long-range uh, capability that allows the Navy to see further than they have ever been able to see in history. Uh, why, why is that important? That is important because at the end of the day, the Navy now can put themselves in a different distributed maritime operation where they actually can get in an offensive def position versus a defensive position, which is very key. When you go from v that V1 configuration, that Flight 3, to a backfit on a Flight 2A, you have that same technology. You, it's everything that you get in the, the V1, except it's in a smaller scale. So you went from a 37 RMA four-phase configuration to a 24 RMA uh, configuration uh, it just shrunk down to fit into the hull of the ship. So one of the important things is that on the AMDR, because we exceeded the requirements so much on the Flight 3, the Navy's able to get, meet the same requirement on the V4 configuration. So it's a, if you compare it to like a SPY-1, you get a SPY plus 15DB in the 24 RMA configuration. And as you remember, that RMA, that's a radar module assembly, as you can see behind me, which is the you know two foot squared box. It's a radar in a box. Uh, you can power this up, you can cool it, put it in your backyard, and you can start tracking targets. Last question, the V4 arrays, they will all come from the same factory just outside Boston? That's correct. They're going to be built, at, we, everything's co-located, so everything's done in Andover, so the V1s, V2s, V3s, and V4s all built in the same factory. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.